right, guys. If you could go ahead and get seated, we're going to get started in a minute here. Um, we're really lucky this morning to have four of our amazing fourth year rotating medical students presenting all very interesting and different cases. Um, they've put a lot of preparations. So we're really excited to see these talks. Um, to start us out this morning, Ian Christensen is one of our Utah medical students uh, who's going to be talking to us about ocular syphilis. A uh, little bit about Ian. He was born actually down in Provo, uh, but it sounds like after a couple of weeks moved to China, is that right? Uh, and then spent some time traveling uh, with his family in the foreign services before ending up back here. So welcome, Ian. Take it away. OK. Um, well, thanks for that kind introduction, Tina. Uh, my name's Ian. I'm a fourth year medical student here at the University of Utah, as she said. Um, today I'm presenting on ocular syphilis. So kind of the point of this presentation is to sort of provide uh, an overview of ocular syphilis. And um, I also have an interesting case uh, that was seen here at the Moran Eye Center that I'm also going to present um, in conjunction with this. So uh, many of you may recognize this handsome gentleman. This is Christopher Columbus. And uh, you know, it's kind of this brief history of syphilis, which I didn't realize before I started this presentation or preparing this presentation. Um, there's credible evidence that Christopher Columbus and his crew actually brought syphilis back from the New World to Europe. Um, and the first known epidemic of syphilis was in 1495 among French troops besieging Naples. And uh, how they got it is anyone's best guess. Maybe Spanish mercenaries has been sort of suggested as a hypothesis. Um, I thought that was kind of an interesting tidbit of, uh, of history. And of course, syphilis continued to ravage the old world for uh, hundreds of years in Europe. And uh, <clears throat> until these two gentlemen um, discovered that it was caused by a treponema pallidum. And uh, they discovered this in their lab. That these are two uh, German researchers. And then penicillin was discovered in uh, 1940. And since then, syphilis has become a relatively treatable condition. Um, in the United States, um, syphilis was, you know, at, fairly high prevalence, but it, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, the prevalence declined precipitously uh, and uh, due to the success of many sort of uh, public health programs. And it kind of reached a nadir in the year 2000 at around 2.7 on a national level, 2.7 per 100,000 persons. Um, unfortunately, since then, it's been going back up. And as you can see from this graph, Utah is not immune to this trend. And it's also uptrending here, although we are at a lower rate than the rest of the country um, in general. So, um, and as you might expect from a sexually transmitted disease, the prevalence is highest in the younger population and uh, increases in men, especially men who have sex with men. And um, it's also associated with IV drug use and um, female sex workers are higher risk for this disease. So um, just something to keep an eye out for. So we're, we're gonna move on to the case. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, not a picture of the man who came in. Um, I'm sure he looks much happier than uh, the gentleman who was that with syphilis. But he came into uh, the uveitis clinic and was seen by Dr. Chris Conradi and uh, Dr. Shakur. And uh, he's a 25, we'll call him James. Um, it's not his real name. But he was a 25-year-old male with unspecified liver disease, secondary to alcohol use. He presented with two months of blurry vision in his left eye. So he had sort of this brown spot in his left eye that he noticed. Um, a few months before he presented to clinic in January. And uh, he also had some peripheral uh, flashing lights in his vision. So um, Dr. Conradi, uh, being an excellent clinician, we all know him to be, uh, gathered a thorough history. And um, it was you know, relatively unremarkable. Uh, he has this liver disease, as mentioned, uh, anxiety, PTSD, no surgeries. He was adopted, um, so not much of a family history that could be gathered there. Um, he, on review of systems, he reported having headaches, he had some hearing loss bilaterally that had since resolved, and some skin sores, alopecia, sort of some non-specific symptoms, um, and, uh, and his social history is a little bit more interesting. Um, he has four dogs and two cats, uh, one of the cats not pictured here, these aren't his, and uh, he's a, man, uh, a male who has sex with men, and uh, he's, he has a fiance with whom he is currently sexually active. He's a heavy smoker, some marijuana, a prior heavy drinker. He's since stopped since being diagnosed with liver disease. And some jail time in the past, he's on parole currently. Um, no international travel, no IV drug use, no history of herpes zoster. Um, so 
just as a uh, sort of a, away from the case here, the ocular findings of syphilis, um, before, or before we move on to the exam, the ocular findings of syphilis are fairly uh, broad. So as you can see from this chart, um, it can involve pretty much any anatomic location of the eye, and it can cause any type of uveitis, posterior, intermediate, anterior, and um, there's some suggestion that, uh, or some research to suggest that posterior uveitis or pan-uveitis are the most common presentation. It can involve one eye or both eyes. Um, it can occur in any stage of syphilis, so primary, secondary, tertiary. And um, so the idea is, or the point is that it's um, difficult to identify by exam alone. And uh, even if they present with ocular syphilis, it can sort of mimic a lot of other things. It could be autoimmune or, um, or any other sort of infectious ideology. So the point is it's important to uh, gather a thorough history and look for risk factors um, when it comes to diagnosing syphilis. So on exam, uh, he had remarkably reduced visual acuity. He was 20-20 before this event. Um, he was 22-50 in his left eye. His right eye seemed to be unaffected. Um, he was vomiting that day, so uh, you know some of the, the testing was not done. Um, he did not have a fluorescein angiography um, done because he was already nauseous and vomiting. Here's his slit lamp exam, which sort of shows this pan-uveitis type picture. Um, and uh, so moving on to some of the imaging, um, here's his uh, picture of his fundus, um, color picture of his fundus. As you can see, uh, there, I have a note here uh, in case I forget the more accurate descriptions, but uh, he's got some placoid like spots here, as you can see. Um, the next picture here is an uh, 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 autofluorescence um, image. Um, he's multiple uh, hyper autofluorescent foci, uh, placoid inferior changes. You can kind of see that here. Um, his right eye, however, is unaffected. And um, on OCT, which is a little bit harder to appreciate, but he has some overlying botrytis. Um, significant ISOS loss inferiorly and subretinal deposits. So at this point, um, thinking about a differential, um, you know he does have risk factors for syphilis, and he uh, but he and he does have PETS. Um, maybe thinking about Toxoplasma gondii, um, and uh, he does have prison time uh, exposure potentially to TB. Um, all things that should be tested for, in addition to kind of some of these autoimmune things that could cause. Um, pan uveitis. Um, so, uh, in terms of syphilis testing, um, the CDC website has two algorithms for it, for this. Um, this is kind of the reverse screening al algorithm, which is gaining popularity. Um, this is sort of the more traditional one, and both are offered by ARUP. I think you know this one to me seems a little bit simpler, um, and uh, kind of this RPR test is a non-treponemal antibody test. Um, RPR or VDRL, which are useful and very sensitive um, for this disease. And so uh, it's important to get this, and it's also useful for tracking the disease and tracking for resolution of the disease after treatment. So, um, and then this uh, treponemal pallidum antibody test is important for kind of confirming the diagnosis. It's much more specific to syphilis. Um, so this gentleman, he received uh, he had his RPR titer tested, and it was highly reactive, uh, 1 to 4,000. Um, he had his <coughs> FDA antibody tested, it was reactive. Um, another thing I failed to mention is that, uh, you know, given his risk factors, he should always be tested for um, HIV. And if he had not been tested in the past, you should definitely test for that. Um, Toxoplasma gondii, he was tested for and was negative. Uh, his TB test was negative, and he had a CMP, CBC, and chest x-ray, which were mostly unremarkable, except for um, these elevated liver enzymes consistent with his previously diagnosed liver disease. So um, treatment and management of syphilis. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to test and treat um, all of the patient's partners. Uh, in, term, in terms of uh, tracking the disease, once you find a case of syphilis, you should have reported to the health department. Um, and for ocular syphilis, you should treat it like neurosyphilis, which is 10 to 14 days of IV penicillin, um, as opposed to you know, your normal garden variety syphilis, um, which is only treated with one dose of penicillin. So you should test for HIV, as I mentioned, and a lumbar puncture is indicated as well to uh, sort of rule out more systemic, or rather rule out neurosyphilis in conjunction with ocular syphilis. And um, 
you can consider systemic steroids on day two to three for treatment of Jarrett's Herxheimer reaction, um, which as you may recall is when some of the bacteria, the bacteria begin to die and you have sort of a, an allergic type reaction, um, the toxins released by the bacteria. And this is, uh, this is kind of a soft recommendation. Um, and uh, once, once the patient has been treated, um, then you should uh, retest in six to 12 months and a fourfold decrease in the RPR titer kind of indicates cure. Um, <clears throat> and so you can assess for whether or not they need to be retreated or if they failed their initial treatment. Um, and there are some alternative antibiotics that can be used if they're allergic to penicillin, um, which I won't go into. So uh, this patient was referred to the e ED, um, told to go straight there, and um, he didn't. And uh, four months went by, and this is a depiction of Dr. Conradi, who I'm sure was very uh, frustrated, calling his patient, uh, I think over 50 times, talking to him and his mother, uh, urging him to go and get treated. Um, but he never did, but he came back to the clinic, and uh, he had not yet received treatment. Um, his vision was worsening in his left eye. He didn't have any complaints in his right eye. He had fluctuating eye sensitivity and um, floated, floaters in his temporal, uh, or fluctuating eye sensitivity to light and uh, floaters in his temporal vision. Um, and so on exam, his, his visual acuity actually looked better. Um, I was talking to Dr. Conradi and it sounded like, you know, the exam was kind of difficult the first time around. Uh, he was vomiting actively. He was not feeling well at all. Um, but uh, his visual acuity uh, quantitatively was, was a little bit better. But he also he had an APD, minimally reactive to light on the left, um, which can be indicative of, of syphilis <coughs> infection. And he had sort of this interesting uh, superior visual field defect. Um, so uh, on slit lamp exam, you can see that uh, the right eye is beginning to show some signs of involvement, um, whereas, uh, you know, in, in the uh, retinal, retinal exam, he has these hypopigmented spots superiorly and a placoid-like distribution. And his left eye is also um, looking at least the same and probably and a little bit worse. He has this sort of significant RPE modeling now, white chororetinal punctate spots throughout the mid-periphery with overlying inflammation um, <clears throat> and clear signs of inflammation uh, in the anterior eye as well. So um, he's not looking too good. This is uh, a black and white photo, uh, photo of the fundus. Um, you can see here, it's a little bit harder to appreciate, but maybe some uh, you know, modeling here and um, disc kind of discoloration uh, compared to his January um, fundus photo. Here we have his right eye, which is a little bit harder to appreciate, maybe some increased um, sort of peripheral color changes over here. And then this is the most remarkable of um, his photos. And um, this is fluorescein angiography, which he did not get on his initial presentation. Um, but you can see here um, that there's some significant peripheral ferning, uh, some scattered hyperfluorescence uh, with some optic nerve uh, leakage here. So um, clearly uh, sort of a worsened clinical picture. Um, again, he was urged to go to the emergency department and uh, to this day, and um, to this day, does not seem to have received treatment. So, hopefully, he comes back and gets treated. And uh, that's it. Any questions? Yes. Do you have a sense of uh, false negative RPRs? In other words, patients that have syphilis that have a negative, the positive FTA and a negative <coughs> RPR. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was um, so a false positive. I'm not sure what the exact rate is. Um, I think that the the sense is that it's it's much more sensitive, and um, that you know it should be confirmed with the FDA uh, antibody. But I'm not sure that the exact rate is. No. You're talking about false, false negative. False oh, negative. oh, false negative. Sorry. Patients asked if it was a false negative. Mm -hmm. um, some sources that I read said that uh, it can be as high as like 70 percent, um, or not sorry, sorry, 30 percent. Um, it can be as high as 30 percent. Um, I'm not sure what uh, if that's changed. Um, and it could have to do with kind of the rising popularity of this reverse screening algorithm, um, which may lead to less, uh, less of that. Um, but I wasn't able to find exact numbers. So. Mm -hmm. so I thought that um, this, the Department of Health would um, get after folks like this. Right. I mean, usually if you order an RPR and it comes back positive, mm -hmm. the health department calls you before you even get the lab result back. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so uh, syphilis is not a um, disease that they'll, you know, come banging on your door to, you know, throw penicillin in you? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, it doesn't appear to be. Um, this, I guess not in this guy's Yeah, case. I mean, this guy, very he went four months uh, without having, yeah, I mean, he, he did answer the phone occasionally, um, but still refused to go. It sounded like he even presented <coughs> to the emergency department at Intermountain Health and then left, and he came here and then left without being treated. Um, so, again, I'm, yeah, I mean, he seems like a fairly invasive character. Hopefully he comes back and then, um, at the very least, be an interesting case study in the natural history of ocular syphilis. And then the health department it takes responsibility for tracking down the contacts, right? <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I understand, yeah. So, um, I, I'm not sure what the status is for him on that. And Chris Conrad, he did like have several phone calls with the health department too. I mean, he, I couldn't believe the measures he went to to try and get this guy treated. Well, I can believe it. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.